flavorful sausage, juicy burgers, tender meatballs, homemade meatloaf. These tasty recipes all have something in common, ground meat. Accessible, economical, and so very versatile, there are many varieties of meats that can be ground. Beef, pork, lamb, poultry, or even seafood. And they all yield delicious results. First, a classic comfort food that always takes me back to my childhood. It's my mom's recipe for a meatloaf with a sweet and tangy glaze, a very popular recipe. And for those of you who aren't lucky enough to have a good butcher in your neighborhood, my good friend and butcher extraordinaire, Pat Lafreda, is here to teach the simple technique for grinding meat at home. And he's also going to share his family recipe for Italian pork sausage, whether you like it hot or sweet. Then for your next backyard barbecue, I'll teach you how to make the ultimate burger by combining different cuts of meat to suit your very own taste and show-stopping giant meatballs made tender with ricotta cheese for a hearty family meal. Stay tuned. I think you're going to find this show right up your alley. Now this is a very, very easy, basic recipe, but it has a couple little additions that really make it very tasty. Mom used to make this, oh, at least once a week because we would eat it and then we would also make sandwiches of it to take to school. Start with four slices of white bread right in the food processor. And so now just pulse until these become bread crumbs. Mom always made her own breadcrumbs. She never thought of buying them, heaven forbid, because we always had ends of bread left over from sandwiches. So this goes right into two and a half pounds of ground beef. Mom always used chuck. And now back into the food processor, two whole carrots peeled, cut into pieces, and two ribs of celery. These vegetables add a nice moisture to the meatloaf and a lot of good flavor. You should check the blade in your food processor. Make sure that the blade is nice and sharp. After a year or two of use, you might have to have it sharpened or you might have to even replace it and get a new blade. So look how pretty that looks. Wow, that looks so great. And now grind up your onions, yellow onions, one big yellow onion peeled and coarsely chopped, some Italian flat leaf parsley, about a half a cup of leaves, and two cloves of garlic. Now all of these vegetables and the breadcrumbs too really do lighten the meatloaf, make it less dense and certainly more flavorful. Perfect. So that's the basic solids for this meatloaf. And you can make three or four if you're having a big family get together at the beach or at the camp. Now add salt, one tablespoon of salt, and two teaspoons of pepper. A half a cup of ketchup. Mom used a lot of ketchup. Uh, she liked it a lot. And she also liked dried mustard, two teaspoons of dried mustard, and one egg. And you can mix it up with a fork, but I remember mom just throwing it into the whole mix. Now start with a wooden spoon or a spatula, and then you can really mix the rest of it with your hands. So now use your hand. And I like to keep one hand kind of clean just in case I have to answer the telephone. So there. You can have a free form meatloaf if you like, but I find it works really well in a bread loaf pan like this. And I have buttered the pan. You can also use olive oil just to have an easy release. Okay, so now just pack this into the loaf pan. And it looks like a lot. It does cook down and shrink a little bit during baking. Preheat your oven to 375 degrees. And as mother said, always get every last speck out of the bowl. Do not waste. So you don't want any air pockets. And I like to go with my fingers just down the sides 
so that it will kind of mound nicely when it bakes. Okay, so now for the topping. Into a half a cup of ketchup, add a teaspoon of that same dried mustard, powdered dried mustard. And here you have two tablespoons of brown sugar. So that's a little bit surprising as a topping for a meatloaf, but when you taste it, it's mom's version of barbecue sauce. That's really what it is, a simple barbecue sauce. So coat well. I like using a brush like this. It works very easily. Is your mouth watering yet? This bakes for 90 minutes or until a thermometer in the center reads 160 degrees. So here's the meatloaf. I've let it cool just a little bit and it baked on a rack in a parchment lined baking sheet. There's a lot of juice. So let the juice just pour out and the meatloaf comes right out in a loaf. Surprise, surprise, like it's supposed to. There. So now this sliced is so good for dinner. Perfect slice. You can see all the lovely vegetables in the meat and continue slicing arrange on a platter and serve your meatloaf if you're lucky to have any left over just remember it makes the best meatloaf sandwich as part of this show i just had to have my friend and butcher pat lafreda come here to show us how to make the best sausage. It's really exciting to make sausage. And this is a tried and true recipe for Italian style pork sausage. With your spice mix and your meat, can't fail, right? You can't. Okay. Our ingredients have no preservatives in it at all. So no nitrates, no MSG. Better what cut of pork is this that I'm cutting up into strips? This is a pork butt. So this is about an 80-20 ratio of meat to fat, which is exactly what you're looking for in sausage. 80 to 20. Right, because okay. a lot of that fat's going to cook out. Right. Okay. And what we're doing here is, since we're going to be grinding this once through a coarse plate, we want to make strips like these. So, Shall I start putting yeah, them in? Yeah, sure. Great. And I can feed and you can push. So cut the meat while it's cold, right? You, you taught yes. me that. Don't put your thumb down too far. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Speed us up a little bit. Now I have at home my grand uncle's oh, yes. old hand meat grinder because we used to grind everything. When my mom wanted to make hamburger, we ground the meat because uh, we didn't have a Pat Lafreda around. Plus so. if you were cutting steaks, you had trimmings or anything like that, yeah. you could make a great burger and you'd, you would know exactly what was in the burger. So this recipe calls for three pounds of pork butt. So that's something you can order from your local butcher. See, this is clear particle definition, as we say, as butchers, where we could see where the proteins and the fats are separate. I see, yeah, very if nice. If you don't have that, it's more of an emulsified grind, something similar to hot dogs. Yeah. But that's not what we're looking for that's in Italian mush. sausage. Mush. Mush. <laughs> if it was a bratwurst, it would be okay. In Italian sausage, we're looking for texture. Right. And then we're looking for good seasonings. It's fun to make sausage with friends, too. Yes. For us, it was always okay. a great thing to be able to make sausage with grandpa. So, I mean, yeah. To sit and around. I love and... that. Okay, so here are our seasonings. So we're going to start off with three tablespoons of ground fennel. We have a quarter teaspoon of anise. The anise giving us a little bit of a uh, licorice flavor, uh, which works out really well. And that's sugar. One tablespoon of sugar and one tablespoon of fine sea salt and one tablespoon of freshly ground black pepper. And what's very important is that we have our fennel seeds toasted. So ground fennel as well as fennel seed. Right, if you were not to bite on a fennel seed while eating it, at least you have that ground fennel in the background so that you wouldn't miss it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add an ounce and a half of water to the seasoning. And this is a great way to get those seasonings activated. Now, do you mix that in by hand or do you put this back through the machine? Oh no, again? we're gonna oh. put this in by hand. We're gonna hand okay. mix it. Then we're gonna put the funnel on, the sausage funnel, and then we're going to put our casings on the funnel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the head of this off. What's very important is that when we take this off, 
we're going to take the knife and plate out because oh. we, don't, we don't need it anymore. We can okay. just put it on for a second. Oh. But what's important is this push meat. So this is the meat that didn't get to come out. Okay, so. And it's very important that we take it out now. Because that's going to be a big lump in a sausage. Well, what it's going to do is this would block up the plate. So when, oh. the, when the softer ground meat came through, it blocks it. Okay. And then more emulsified meat will come out. So, okay. so this goes on now? Yes. Now it's time to get our casings onto the sausage funnel. So you've had those soaking in water just to keep them moist. Right. I have had these rinsed and then soaking in water so that they get a little softer. And now is this the way they come on this piece of uh, blue plastic? They're available like this oh, now. I remember great. the days of tangling with 100 feet of hog casing. Oh. So this slides right onto oh, the horn. I didn't see that Without before. having all that problem. You just pull the tube out. Oh, how fantastic. And okay, it saves okay. you a lot of time. Excellent. What we're going to do is we're going to make two types of sausages. We're going to make sweet Italian and then hot Italian. Okay. The sweet traditionally is left long and the hots are usually linked. It's a very simple sausage. And if you look at a lot of commercial sausage sold, they really have a lot of preservatives. So for those of you who have wanted to try your sausage, you see it's not so difficult. You don't have to have Pat in your kitchen, although it's very <laughs> nice to have him here. So there, we've gotten through. Now I put the little lumps in. Yep, so now you're gonna put your last little bit of push meat in, which is gonna push the push rest meat. of, because we still have meat in here, we don't wanna waste it. So as you put that in, this just moves another two inches, let's say. Yes. And then that's gonna be the end of it. So okay. we, can, we can stop it there, and then we're just gonna pull this off. This will break easily. Oh, okay. So we're going to transfer that coil to this cutting board. And simply, Start in the center. You don't have to tie off the end? Nope. You don't oh. have to tie off the end. So I'm ready to tie links. Well, we're going to link the hot sausage. Okay. With a link, you'll be able to portion control that. Well, this is a beautiful ring of sweet sausage. Yes. To make hot sausage, what's in here that's different? Same seasonings. What's different about this is that we add crushed red pepper and cayenne. So you get that extra oh, yeah. heat. My favorite. And this is uh, a pan of the linked hot sausages that Pat made for me. Yes. These are beautiful too. So they can just go on the grill like that too. Just like that. So can you show me how to make the links? Yes, to make the links, I usually like to have a little bit of casing on the end so that it doesn't open. And then I'm gonna take my hand, put it across, it's about five inches. And at the very end of that, I'm gonna squeeze down what that'll do is fill the casing tightly. Right. And then I want to roll it. Oh, great. Just like that. What fun. Now I'm going to make my next link, same thing with my hand, locate that position, and then I'm going to roll it in the opposite direction. And I'm going to do that all the way so down. So much fun. And usually they're about four links to a pound. Okay. So, so we should end up with, uh, for three pounds, 12 links. Yes. How perfect. Well, this is a very fun lesson. Thank you so, so much, Pat. My pleasure. And I do encourage each and every one of you to try making sausage at home. It's easy and it is fun. Do the burgers at your favorite restaurant always taste better than those that you make at home? Well, that's likely due to the popular restaurant trend of custom blending their cuts of meat to create burgers with the best proportions of flavor and fat. So let me show you what I mean. Right now I'm going to grind some meat that is half sirloin, half chuck. Grind as little or as much meat together as you'd like. Just keep the ratio 50-50. Grinding equal amounts of chuck and sirloin give us the juiciness while adding beefiness. And cut these into strips also for grinding. This is a beautiful piece of chuck. And you can get all of this right at your butcher, the chunks of meat, and it, it actually makes you feel good to grind your own. It's a little bit more artisanal, which I think is the trend and also good for your family because you know what you're giving them. So let's grind. I have my meat grinder right here, fitted with the coarse disc and I'm doing a little bit of chuck and a little bit of sirloin, alternating. It works so well. At home, a food grinder makes short work of little slivers of meat like this. It's really just great. So now I've changed the disc to the finer blade. So you have it first 
coarse, then finer. And you can just feed the meat right back down the tube. Now that looks more like the hamburger meat that you buy at the fancy butcher. Also, if you like steak tartare, this is probably the best way to grind your steak tartare. For that, I would use the leanest, tenderest cut that you can find. No fat allowed in steak tartare. So there you have perfect, perfect ground meat. Now to form the burgers. This is enough for four large burgers. So just divide it into quarters. Handle the meat gently. Don't squeeze it and squash it. <laughs> I like to make it into a round first and then into a patty. That looks really good. And have your griddle pan heated on the stove. Best to make these immediately and eat them. And you can turn these into cheeseburgers, bacon burgers, whatever kind of burger you desire. It's nice to make a little indentation in the center like that. This little indentation will prevent the ballooning effect as it cooks. So instead of getting bigger in the middle, it will flatten out. So let's get this burger right on the griddle. And this one. Now, do you like yours rare? medium rare, medium, or well done. Okay, so sprinkle with a little bit of salt, coarse salt, and pepper. Two and a half minutes on each side for rare, three minutes for medium rare. So now these are very nice rolls for the hamburgers. You can just lightly toast them. I like just the insides toasted. Some thinly sliced sharp cheddar right on top of the burger. So I want mine to be rare. Put this on your toasted bun. Mmm, looking really good. Definitely ketchup. Definitely some lettuce, tomato, pickles. You can have your choice of dill pickles, bread and butter pickles and some Russian dressing too, which I love. Another piece of lettuce. So there, the perfect burger served at home. And in addition, this is the steakhouse burger, which is a wonderful mix of sirloin and short rib. And this is the turkey burger on an English muffin. Take your choice. These burgers are definitely a cut above the ordinary. Wouldn't you agree? Italians call them polpette. Mexicans call them albondigas. Across almost every culture, there are meatballs. To make great meatballs, you need to start with great meat. For my giant meatball recipe, I like to use a combination of beef, veal, and pork. I also like to use Italian bread that is torn up into quite small pieces and moistened with a little bit of milk. Let it soak up the milk and then you're gonna squeeze out the moisture and we're gonna chop this even finer. You don't want big pieces of bread in your giant meatballs. Now, for the most well-rounded meatball, use equal parts of beef, pork, and veal. Beef adds substance, the fat from the pork adds flavor, and the veal, which is richer in collagen, helps hold everything all together. So now just squeeze out the excess milk. There's not too much, because I didn't use very much, but you see the bread has really softened nicely. And chop it up to add to the meat mixture. So now just chop. This bread adds a kind of fluffiness to the ground meat and a lightness too. So you could use breadcrumbs and a lot of Italian cooks do, but I like to use this moistened bread because I think it adds a tenderness to the meatballs. Now here's our bowl of meat. This is the beef, this is the pork, and this is the veal. It's icy cold and we're going to mix this all together. Again, you could put on a pair of rubber gloves if you like, but 
Mixing this all by hand really helps incorporate all the ingredients. Wash your hands well after you do this and keep the meat nice and cold, important. Add one teaspoon of salt and three quarters of a teaspoon of black pepper, one teaspoon of chopped oregano, and half a cup of uh, chopped parsley, and half of a medium onion finely chopped, one cup of Parmesan cheese, grated. Now this is ricotta, one and a half cups, and the breadcrumbs. Now if you're ready to get your hands dirty, <laughs> you can start to mix this together with your hands. One egg too, don't forget, that's gonna go in last. One egg broken up with a fork. So there, this is everything you need for a meatball that you're gonna love. The ricotta adds such a flavor and texture. So this whole bowl, three pounds of meat, a pound of each kind of meat, and all these other ingredients actually makes eight giant meatballs. So there, that is a good mix. And we need eight. So I'm dividing it into quarters and each quarter into half. We'll see how even we come out. Now, parchment in your baking sheet and brush it with olive oil. It really helps keep the meat from sticking. And if you've mixed this up with your hands, your hands are moist enough to form a healthy and pretty meatball. Notice I'm not compacting it, I'm just really trying to get it into a nice ball without it falling apart. Now these meatballs actually shrink a little bit during roasting. A little bit of effort is certainly worth it. Now, just a tad of olive oil on top of each. This helps the meatballs brown. And right into 450 degrees for 15 to 20 minutes until golden brown. So now these are hot out of the oven. And this is marinara sauce. It's the most basic tomato sauce, and it's just made of tomatoes, olive oil, garlic, and a few red pepper flakes. So very simple, and gently place them right in the sauce. These are really good. Okay. So I like to spoon the sauce over the tops of the meatballs too, just to make sure they're submerged. Simmer, approximately 30 minutes, partially covered. Make sure you do not scorch the sauce. So adjust the heat, medium, low is good. So there we have it. Simmered beautifully, plump and fat. I think one meatball per person is enough, but you judge. I'm just putting a meatball on top of a toasted piece of Italian bread with a spoon or two of the marinara sauce. Mmm. Yummy. With or without a garnish of Parmesan cheese, this is mouth-wateringly good. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode of Cooking School. In a large bowl, we'll combine one cup fresh breadcrumbs, one pound ground turkey, two ounces grated cheddar cheese, and a half a small onion coarsely grated. Season with salt and pepper, mix gently, and form into two-inch patties. Cook the patties in one teaspoon of olive oil until just browned and cooked through. That takes about five minutes. Serve on small rolls with your favorite condiments.